Harry Davis and I'm the Chair of Curzel Vale Allotment and Horticultural Society and I also keep bees. My name's Jack Hobbs and I am a member of the Lower Curzel Allotment Association. Uh, I am also, it is alleged, uh, a beekeeper. Uh, I don't know if you know but uh, the home for the Manchester and District Beekeepers Association is in Heaton Park and the public are more than welcome, uh, especially on a Sunday uh, afternoons, uh, 12 hour 4, there's beekeepers on duty at a place called the Dower House. At the moment, I'm in the process of uh, making up a super, which is a box that the bees will put the honey in. And basically, we will glue them and we will screw them. Normally they're supplied with nails, we don't believe in nails because you can easily split the woods. So, all the equipment that comes with beekeeping is in a uh, flat pack farm and you haven't got to be brain of Britain to assemble them. In the area we used to have, over this way, about a mile or so over here, we had Agecroft Pit. Adjacent to Agecroft Pit was Agecroft Power Station. Adjacent to Agecroft Power Station was Thermalite Block. So the coal came out of the pit into the power station, the ash went to make the thermalite block. We also had Cousins' Salt Factory, which was a mile over in this direction. And further on from there, we had the sewage farm up in uh, just at the back of Drinkwater Park, which used to pump its effluent into the River Irwell, which comes along the back here and round and right at the back of our apiary. And it used to be the most polluted river in Europe. But now, it's one of the cleanest in the country. They do say if you do have uh, honeybees on your allotments, uh, you'll increase production by 20%. I don't know how they can prove that, but that's what they say to us. But I think it would be logical, uh, if you've got pollinators on your plot, that you will increase your, your production. And one of the, the good ways of gardening as well is to take that biodiversity approach to it as well. Don't be seeing off what you call weeds and all this lot. Let the bodage grow. And the, uh, what else have we got comfrey. over there? We've got the comfrey growing there. It's attracting the bees. We've got the bodage over there. We've got the teasels over there as well growing. We've got all them and the dandelions. And they're all pollinators, you know what I mean? They're encouraging all the, the honeybees and the bumblebees to come and pollinate all the crops that we have on the allotments. Like Jack was saying, it increases the yield on the plots. And we definitely need the bumblebees as well because the honeybee will not pollinate the tomato plants. And as you can see on this site, there's lots and lots of what we call greenhouses with tomato plants in and we need the bumblebees to pollinate all them plants for us. So what we're going to do now, we're going to take you on a journey out of our great city of Salford, down the River Irwell cor Corridor, onto the rooftops of Manchester to see the urban bees. So come on Jack, off we go son. Eh? Give me sunshine. <laughs> So where we are, we've now crossed the River Irwell, which is just behind us, out of sunny Salford, and we're now into Manchester, and we're outside Manchester Cathedral, and we've come to see a friend of ours. What's his name, Jack? Adrian. Uh, a lot of people won't know this, but uh, on top of these roofs over here, we've got beehives. Oh my god! Hey? So here we are on the roof of Manchester Cathedral. Jack, just go on and look what Adrian's got here. Fantastic four colonies. A, B, C, and D. Uh, I'm Adrian Rhodes. I'm an honorary canon in the uh, Diocese of Manchester. Uh, and I'm one of the chaplains here at Manchester Cathedral. And we've got four hives here on the roof. We started keeping them uh, about a couple of years ago. And uh, this year we've now. Uh, expanded to four hives and hoping to get some decent honey this year. The church and the bees, you know, I know they go back like hundreds of years, don't they? Because you used to have the, uh, is it, was it the, uh, the, the monks who used to do the mead and things yeah, like they that? certainly so. did, yes. I mean, the, uh, the uh, early days of the um, convents and the, um, the monks in the monasteries, they used to keep honey, keep hives for the honey because it was a greater source of sweetness. And that continues now and I was really impressed one year going 
um, for a holiday in Crete to an ancient monastery there to see hive after hive after hive being kept by the, the monks there as part of their general way of being. But um, if you think there's been quite a lot of notable beekeepers who've been in the church, I mean the Langstroth hive, the Langstroth was a, an American pastor. There was Abbe Warre in France who created the Warre, the people's hive. And then there's uh, Brother uh, Ab Adam, Adam who, who created a, a very wonderful strain of bee. And that's all just in the modern era. But if you go back, the church has always had a connection with it. There's been a sense of the, the bee and the bee colony as being a symbol of, uh, of heaven or of the way the church or the world should work. Right. Yeah. And St. Chrysostom, St. Chrysostom was uh, the Archbishop of Constantinople in the fourth century. He said, um, the bee is blessed above all other creatures because it's the only creature that works not for its own good, but for the good of others. And that, I, think, I guess he was thinking about the way that the uh, hive is a colony and any individual bee doesn't work for itself. It works for the colony. Right, and yeah. this was seen as a symbol, really, of how the, the church should be in the world. And, um, and then, you know, people have used the idea of uh, the bee as being, you know, the servant who works hard, who protects the good things, the richness of the honey. And so there's been lots of symbolism wrapped around the story of hives and bees and honey. Here, uh, and at home, which uh, I know other beekeepers don't do, I use liturgical incense in my smoker. Well, they're oh, only right. bees, aren't they? Because they're, they're only bees. They need to be. Uh, they need to be kept <laughs> calm and gentle. And it, it has. A, I don't know what it does for the bees, but it certainly makes me feel nice and gentle and <laughs> peaceful. And Absolutely. it has a lovely smell. So, is it one of them swingy things you've got? Well, we do have those, but I don't use that in a theoretical. Theori <laughs> fantastic. No, no. It's a fantastic setup. Yeah. Age. Well, we try. So yeah. off, off we go again at our travel. I'm Kay Phillips, I'm the Secretary of Cypress Street Allotments in Harper Hay and I'm a beekeeper. Along with Jenny, Linda, Richard and George, we are the Bay Trees Bee Project and we're based in Harper Hay. So we're here on the Cypress Street Allotments. Below us in the valley is the River Irk and it's called the Irk Valley. And 160, 170 years ago, it's the birthplace of the Industrial Revolution. Um, so it's full, it was filthy, and even Frederick Engels mentioned it in his book, The Conditions of the Working Class, because it was so filthy and polluted. Um, the area around here, the Bay Trees uh, area, we've worked really hard to plant flowers and have green spaces. We've got an orchard, we've got an elder people's, older people's uh, garden, children's garden, and hanging baskets, and we're planting the planters um, every year different flowers. Uh, we've got a meadow here and the idea really is not only is it good for humans but it's also good for bees and other insects. So if you imagine you're a bee travelling out from our beehives in the Bay Tree Bee, bee Project, this is the route we think that some of the bees might uh, go on and this is what they might see. So I, as you're looking for food you can see the food on the allotment, you can see the tops of the trees and then as you start to fly out into the rest of Harper Hay, you can find the flowers in people's hanging baskets, in the green spaces and parks, in people's front yards. Um, and then when we, the bit we're looking at now is actually right down the River Irk. Uh, and when we talk about it being a green lung, you can really see what we mean, that there's down the bottom of that valley, there's the river, and then the trees go along the side of it. Um, and along there there's all sorts of flowers and some of them might even be thought of as weeds but for the bee it's something to eat. That's Harper A Road that you can see there and Harper Mount School. The school are developing a wild area that the bees will be able to forage in and when you look around North Manchester that you can see there it actually is a very green place to live. And we travelled down the Irk Valley to visit some of the beekeepers who keep their bees on the roofs of the city centre buildings. Here we are at the print works. I'm going to go and talk to Fred Booth, who's the beekeeper, and he's going to take us up on the roof. Around this 
way. Hi, my name's Fred Booth and I'm the Santa Director of the Printworks, as well as being the beekeeper. Up here on the, on the roof of the Printworks, and I mean, I think a lot of people will have been to the Printworks and they know you can eat food and drink and you can uh, watch a film, but I don't think many people know what hive of activity there is up here. You've got chickens and you've got bees. Can you tell us why that is? Well, initially we started off with the uh, vegetables um, and a few plants. And uh, that really got us thinking about where do we go from here? Um, so last year, I took the decision to install the hives. And I've been learning a lot about the bees over that period. And very shortly, we'll be getting the Printworks first honey. Then it got me thinking, where do we go from here now? So a few months ago, I took the decision to get some chickens. So now we have six chickens, which lay every day with the Printworks eggs. So we'll have our own little shop at this rate. Wow. But what made you do it? Why? What does um, it do for the Printworks? It, it's really looking at the, the owners are very keen to look at green initiatives. So that's why we initially started with the, the vegetables and plants. And the other reason behind it was for a charity based organisation as well. So the proceeds from all of these things will end up going back to the homeless and Forever Manchester. Right, okay. Okay, so you give it to a homeless charity? Yeah, the Booth Centre, right. uh, no relation, um, <laughs> which is uh, located behind Victoria train station. Right, okay. So do the staff from the Printworks know that this is all up here? Do they come and have a look? All of the tenants, all of the staff know what's up here and a lot of them volunteer to get involved, whether it's cleaning out the chickens, whether it's helping with making sure the plants are watered. Um, so they're all very keen. Um, and on a day like today, you wouldn't want to be up here than downstairs. Yeah, so everyone benefits. Everybody benefits. Yeah. Brilliant. So how do you manage with the bees? I mean, what happens if they swarm? Um, well, it has happened um, three times this year. And with the help of Adrian from the cathedral, we've managed to eventually find the queen in the mass of bees. <laughs> and it's been amazing to actually see all of the bees follow the queen back into a box. To actually stand there and see that um, was just amazing. <laughs> So what did you do? You put the queen back in? We found the queen, which was marked, yeah. put her back in a box, and then we laid a cloth down, yeah. and basically the swarm, en masse, very slowly, went into the box <laughs> until we had them all together again. Right. Then obviously we start all over again. Yeah. So your bees are obeying the textbooks? They are, yeah. They're, they're following the pattern of what they would normally ha happen. Yeah. But it, it's good experience. And once you've handled it, um, you're confident that if it does happen again, you can deal with it. Yeah, yeah. And because we're on the roof, they're not going to impact on anybody on a lower level. Um, and we don't get many foxes on the roof, so we don't have to worry <laughs> about um, the hens either. Yeah, just the falcons. Notice the other thing you've got here is you've got beautiful vegetables and flower beds. So is this for your bees to feed on? Yeah, well, they do on both of them. Um, particularly um, these plants and weeds that are over here, uh, which all of them were laid by Bez Right. from the Happy Mondays, yeah. um, who is fanatical about bees and keeping bees. Um, so yeah, um, it's a bit like 24-hour um, party people <laughs> downstairs and then this going on upstairs, <laughs> which people wouldn't realise. No, excellent. So here we are at the beautiful Manchester Art Gallery. We're going to go inside and meet John, who's going to show us the beehives on the roof. OK, well, if you follow me, we just need to go from this roof, up this ladder, then over another roof, then down another ladder. OK, so follow me off we here. go. <laughs> yeah. So we go over here. Hang on. So as you can imagine, it's not the easiest location to have beehives and it no. does come with its own problems, yeah. but it does keep the bees out of the way. Um, not so much wind up here, there's no real contact with humans apart from the beekeepers and they can just get on happily with what they need to get along with. Um, so we have to go down these steps here right? and then the hives are actually in this little sort of alcove which is the roof 
of the second floor of the gallery and we're actually on top of all the plant here so we're 40 foot off the ground. Wow. My name is John Mouncy, I'm the Visitor Services Manager at Manchester Art Gallery and I'm a rooftop beekeeper. On the roof of the Art Gallery, the beautiful Manchester Art Gallery, and you'd never guess that this was up here. So John, can you tell us what your role is in the Art Gallery and, and um, how the bees come to be here? My role in the Art Gallery is Visitor Services Manager. So I just look after the staff and the visitors who come into the building. But the, the bees came to be here after reading an, an article in the Sunday Times about the guy who looks after the hives on St Paul's Cathedral and he started by putting a hive on the top of the tower block where he lived near Tower Bridge um, and because of my role at the gallery I was working one weekend it was quite quiet I was reading all about it and I just thought if he can do it why can't Manchester the symbol of Manchester being the bee and I sat there that afternoon and wrote a proposal right. to our director and said, I've got this idea, what do you think? This is how much I think it's going to cost, um, and this is what it'll entail. Um, and all that stuff was vastly naive, <laughs> uh, to be perfectly honest. And, but after three years, we're now here with Sue Hives. OK. And what do you think it does for the art gallery? Um, it links the art gallery very much with the industrial heritage and the history of Manchester. The art gallery itself has a lot of um, bees in the, the roof. Um, and it's also generated a lot of interest from people who actually come in and ask about it. Because um, it's, it's now led from the beehives to more a sustainability thing, what we can actually do and work with other people who keep bees in Manchester. Right, so you're right in the middle of the city centre. Yeah. What do you think your bees are actually feeding on? Well, there is more forage than you probably think. And I think with so much airtime being given towards apply to the bees, people seem to be planting a lot more wildflowers. Ourselves at the gallery, we've planted over the other side of the roof to provide forage, um, which strangely enough, our bees don't seem to go for. <laughs> Because when you see the bees there, they're mostly bumblebees that right, seem to go yeah. for the plant uh, for the flowers we've planted there. You bees will travel quite a distance to go looking for forage. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know exactly, but I know it's somewhere in the region about three or four miles. So if you think of three or four miles from here, that's a lot of forage to go for. Yeah. There's a lot of gardens. You've got the railways with all the sidings. Um, you've got big parks like you know, Whitworth Park and then we've got the park on Canal Street. So there is quite a lot of them to go for. And the honey that we harvested last year was very citrusy. So we think of the lime trees are right. in Manchester. Yeah. Um, and we've also planted some crabapple trees outside the front of the gallery, again, to provide forage when they come into blossom. So we're always trying to encourage other people to plant seeds. Um, and there's plenty within the city that probably because we're not bees we don't actually think well <laughs> one tree can provide a lot of forage for uh, yeah a lot of bees yeah there's a lot of symbols of the bee within the art gallery yes what, what, what's going on there well that's the nod to the in the industrial revolution right um, when the industrial revolution started in manchester um, the mill workers or the mill owners used the symbol of the bee as the work ethic to symbolise their mills, to symbolise the Industrial Revolution. And I think the first mill to adopt it was in Rochdale, which I think was in 1820, 1830, and they called the mills the beehive mills. Right, okay. Um, and it also, the, the, the bee symbol is synonymous with the co-op in yeah, Manchester yeah. as well, the, the workers' cooperative. And the original co-op building had the B on there right, okay. and then when the town hall was built yeah. in 1874 whenever it was yeah. they took the the coat of arms for Manchester as seven um, bees right. in the coat of arms yeah. and they did a mosaic in the floor and in the roof or the walls of the town hall right, okay. which again is all part of Manchester's industrial revolution heritage yeah, yeah. and today because that 
um, industry doesn't exist anymore. Manchester still uses that symbol to promote itself as a city and it's almost like the B is the branding of Manchester. I mean, famously Boddington's use it mm. on the bins and on the bollards all over the city. The B still exists, it used yeah. to be the Busy Bee buses. Mm. And I think the B is actually synonymous with Manchester as a city. Yeah, yeah. So is that reflected in art? Um, there is um, some pieces that do use the bees in the art, but it's mm. mostly the, the actual fabric of the building in the mm. corniches in the roof. Right, okay. And again, it's that, don't forget, I mean, the art galleries were built by the industrialists mm. to provide art for the working people. Mm. So it's using that symbol again, don't forget who you are, what the city is, yeah, and what it actually yeah. means to everybody. Well here we are, we've come to the end of our journey. We've come along the, the River Irwell. We've been on top of the uh, Manchester Cathedral. Yeah. We've seen Adrian with his bees. And I've been uh, down the River Irk and I've been on top of the print works and on top of the art gallery. And now we arrive at the, the Manchester uh, Museum where they have a, a beehive on top of the roof. Uh, once we've uh, had a look at that, apparently they've got uh, a beehive that's uh, apparently 5,000 years old. 5,000 year old? As old as you, Harry. Not time they got a new one then, isn't it? <laughs> well, <laughs> see you in a bit. <laughs> Natural as anything. <laughs> Hello, we are on the top of uh, Manchester University's um, roof with our Manchester Museum hive. Hi, I'm Sam Sporton and I'm Collection Care Manager at Manchester Museum and I'm one of the uh, beekeepers here at Manchester Museum. What the benefits do you get for having your beehives on the roof? Well, we, initially we wanted to have a camera up here, but we couldn't, there's no electricity. And I, but I think having a beehive, we can talk about the issues with bees and their survival with the museum visitors. Yeah. It's something we talk about in public programmes quite a lot. Good. And what, what about the foraging, Sam? What, what, what do you think of foraging? Because I can see a few trees knocking about here. There's a few over, over the this way here? We've, I mean, we've got a lot of lime trees on the site. Right. Um, and also, I think at this time of year, it's um, Himalayan balsam as well. I partly know that because last year I thought they were, they contracted some sort of fungus because they were going no. white on no. their back and it was the no. pollen. Yeah. <laughs> it was yeah. the pollen. So it, me being a new beekeeper, not quite knowing what they were picking up, really. Well, right. a lot of novice beekeepers do make that mistake. Yes, they think they've yeah. got disease, but it's not. It's the balsam when they enter the flower. Yes. It, 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 they pollinate it from the back. And it's really obvious as well, you know, the, you see them going with the sort of white stripes in the back, but they're still collecting a lot of pollen at the moment. Uh, well, I, 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 I would say this year has been one of the uh, greatest honey collection years ever on record. Uh, the blackberry uh, crop has been uh, increased by 80% on last year's figures, apparently. Right. I'm just watching a few going in there now, some of the pollen on the, on the sacks on the back. There's no one going, there are two and kind of three. They're still four, very busy, aren't they? The well, oh, yeah. One yeah. there with the balsam on its head, it's just sneaked in as well. Well, yes. we're, we're new beekeepers as well, we've only been doing it for a couple of years, so we're just learning. Yes. And we're hoping to have another. We want to start with one hive because there's a lot to learn, but hopefully next year we'll have another hive up here too. Yeah, but really good. You've got plenty of room, haven't you, up here? You know what I mean? It's, like you say, looking around, there's plenty of forage on, isn't there? I and think. Just, to just think as well, it's only not so long ago when we was on top of the. Uh, there you go. The cathedral roof, which is what probably about half a mile in that yeah. direction or something, as the as the bee flies. Absolutely, <laughs> I think a lot of it as well though is is sort of about education and talking to the people on campus about bees as well, because they're not all happy that the bees are up here. Some of them are a bit, you know, worried that they might get stung. But the more we talk about them, I think the easier it gets. Yeah. Well, can you tell us about this little thing here, this area? This is the one of the few depictions that we've actually got of a bee on any of our Egyptian objects and it's supposed to be a symbol for Lower Egypt where most of the beekeeping happened in ancient Egypt. Just looking at it you can see the, the outline of the bee with its legs, its wings, its abdomen and I wonder if that's a skep beehive and what it's sat on. I think that's another hieroglyph actually Jack but I'm not mm. sure what it's a hieroglyph for. Okay, okay. What, what's, what year is this dated to? This is, it says up here it's 2400 BC, so it's about four and a half thousand years old. So Sam, can you tell us what this is? This is our very own ancient Egyptian beehive that we've got at the museum, and it's about three and a half thousand years old. 
from the 12th dynasty, and it was found by Flinders Petrie, who's a very famous archaeologist of the 19th century. Right, OK. How long has man been on the planet as such to that? How old would man be? And how old would the bees have been? Oh, I think the bees were here a lot longer than, than, than we have been. Um, and I think the earliest that they've found depictions in Egypt is in the Old Kingdom, which goes back to about 6,000 six thousand years mm -hmm. but it's that doesn't say doesn't mean to say that it hasn't happened before then it's just that those are the earliest records that we've got right, of them okay. doing it i mean it's also i mean the bee was the sign for uh lower egypt because that's where the beekeeping happened around the nile and they would have I've read that they would have moved the these sort of mobile uh beehives around to pollinate at different times of the year right yeah so yeah. can you just lift up so just so, just so i can see inside it oh it, it it really chamfers, don't it? You know, look, look, when you look down. Oh, yeah. Can you show it to the, to the camera, which chamfers right down, so just look a hole at the back, back of it. I mean, the reason they think this is a beehive is because they found pollen on the inside. Right. So, I mean, that's not conclusive evidence, is it, really? But, I mean, that's what they suppose it is. And it was deposited, um, and this is a drawing from 1890, I think. It was deposited with these other artefacts, with these... Um, bronze knives and uh, axes above it in a hole in, the, in, a t in a floor of a tomb. Mm. So it's deliberately buried as well. So it might have had some sort of religious meaning in, you know, in the site yeah. too. We're coming to the end of our journey. Um, we're outside the uh, University of Manchester Museum and uh, we hope you've enjoyed what film we've tried to uh, portray of the bees. And we've all enjoyed doing the little film and uh, we hope you get something from it. Thank you. <laughs> and what we're looking for as well, aren't we? You know, we're, we're looking for using, you know, like no pesticides, things like that. We want to see it as green as possible, as bee friendly as possible. We don't want to see flowers that are no good, like planted here, there and everywhere. We want to see vegetables growing in plants, like, just like we've got here. Like, so we've got the, the garlic here, we've got the nasturtiums, <laughs> we've got the artichokes here at the back, we've got the cauliflowers, we've got the broad beans, we've got the runner beans, we've got the pumpkins, we've got the cabbages over there, sprouts, oh some beetroots as well I've just noticed there, yeah. hiding away. It's fantastic, absolutely fantastic and this is what we're looking for. I mean cause there's lots more people keeping bees in the city centre but what we need to make sure is that we've got enough things for those bees to eat and it's like Harry was just saying you know you wouldn't have a flock of sheep in the city centre and make and not have enough grass for them to eat same goes for the bees we want to make sure as many people as possible get the right kind of flowers that the bees can feed off when you go to the garden centre if you're just choosing you can find sometimes things that have got a little symbol of the bee on which means that that's things that bees or butterflies or bumblebees like to feed on. What we want to create is pollinator friendly cities. The symbol of the bee has been the symbol for Manchester and Salford for 200 years or so because it meant industry and hard work and what we want to do is change that so it means uh, that Manchester and Salford are pollinator friendly cities for all our bees to live in and all our human beings to live in. Yeah, yeah. Go on, go on.